So <coughs> uh, with that in mind, here we go. So the most important thing from my perspective in starting your own business is to have a clear sense of your goals. And those tend to fall into three categories as organized by Simon Sinek, the what, the how, and the why. A lot of the SCORE clients that I work with have a pretty good idea of what it is they wanna do. And they're beginning to develop their sense of how they wanna do it. But often they may not have probed why they wanna do it as deeply as they have the what and the how. All three are important. In the end, the why is often what gets you out of bed in the morning and the what and the how become just strategies on the way to achieving your why. So I encourage you to think equally about the why, the how, and the what, even though what many customers will see is largely the what and the how, sometimes the why is the most important part of a business. It can certainly feature strongly in the business's marketing. It doesn't have to, but you will see many businesses describe why they're doing what they do as part of the marketing. Uh, the what they offer is always part of your marketing because that's what your customers are purchasing. The how you do it is often invisible, but there's usually a fair amount of work that goes into figuring out how you want to offer your product or service. So note down your thoughts on why you might wish to do this, how you will accomplish it, and what is the product or service that you will deliver. Some of these, I presume, are <laughs> things you already have thought about a lot and, and know well, but others uh, may require further thought later. Now, all of this is related to another idea, which is that <clears throat> your business is a lot more than just the product or service that you are offering to your customers. You will have processes that you follow in order to reliably deliver that product or service. You will have policies in place if you have employees or policies for customers, things like customer return policies, so that you can do things consistently with everyone. You may need specific equipment. You may need capital, whether it's working capital to start your business or purchase equipment uh, or fund inventory needs. You may or may not have employees. You will have to establish relationships with vendors and you may wish to automate a number of things within your business, in which case you may need software to help you, doing, to help you do that. And so all of these taken together are really what constitute a business, not just the product or service that the customer is purchasing. And as you approach starting up a business, it's important to have thought about all of these and mapped out how you intend to implement all of these. The product or service is really just the, the, the part of the iceberg that's above the ocean. And all the rest of this is a large part of your business and actually probably requires as much or more thought than the actual product or service you're delivering. <clears throat> so if you're going to launch a business, what is your role as the owner of this business? Uh, the good news is that you get to do anything and everything you want because you're the owner. Uh, the bad news is that you have to do everything because you're the owner. Um, you may hire employees eventually and delegate some things to them. But in general, the owner needs to take responsibility for raising the funds that the business will need, selling your product or service. You are going to be your most effective salesperson for your business. And you, there's no way around that. As the owner, some, some customers just want to talk to the owner. So you will be responsible for selling your product or service. Even if you hire salespeople, a big sale will almost inevitably involve the owner. You are responsible for building your team of people. We'll talk more about this later. And developing your processes 
and monitoring your financial statements. If any of these areas are ones that you feel that you might benefit from developing your skills in a bit further, then it's often very useful to spend the time before you launch the business trying to develop your skills in these other areas because once you start the business, time will be a precious commodity. So once again, take note of the elements that you feel that your particular business will eventually need. Uh, how much money is needed to get break even? You may need to do a cash flow projection in order to figure that out. Many people consider the funds needed to start the business, but more funds are usually needed to operate the business for months and months until you get to the break even point where the business generates cash. Some businesses can break even in their first month. Other businesses may take several years to break even. And it's important that you have a sense of how long your business is likely to need before it starts generating cash instead of consuming cash. What processes will you need to develop for your business? Uh, maybe manufacturing processes, but it could also be <clears throat> uh, product delivery processes, shipping processes. Uh, how do you record sales? How will you keep your books? All those involve processes. What equipment will you need? Who will you get it from? Will you buy it or will you lease it? All challenging questions of its availability. What vendors will you use? What software will be needed? Of all the variety of software packages available for each task, which do you prefer and why? And then what policies are needed both for your customers and for members of your team? All these are questions that you will undoubtedly need to address in the process of starting your business. So as you consider all that, it's worth reflecting a little bit what you bring to the table. Obviously you wouldn't be starting this business if you didn't bring a whole bunch of things to the table, but for areas that you may not have the most useful background, now's the time to dig in and try and develop it further. So do you have personal experience that's relevant to this business? Uh, do you have a tolerance for risk? Every business is inherently somewhat risky, uh, some more so than others, but you should have a sense of how risky this business that you're starting might be and how tolerant you are of that risk. There are many forms of risk. The primary one is often financial risk, but <clears throat> there are um, things that can happen in any business that may raise your blood pressure to an extent that you don't care for. For example, when something goes wrong, lightning tends to strike at the top. So if you're the head of the business, when something goes wrong, you're the one that needs to, in effect, take responsibility and get it fixed. Uh, there are surprises. Somebody doesn't show up for work or somebody doesn't do the work right. And how will you overcome those, particularly when they happen at the last minute? All those are different little forms of risk. Uh, and you need to figure out <clears throat> what kinds of risk you deal with um, evenly without getting upset and what kinds of risks either keep you awake at night <clears throat> or really run your motor to a greater extent than is necessarily good for you or the business. Um, so think about what kinds of risk you tolerate well and which ones you might not tolerate as well and try to think of ways in which you might improve your ability to deal with certain risks. What talents do you bring to your business? Uh, that's sort of the same as your personal experience, but your personal experience can maybe a lot broader than the specific talents that you bring to your business that you suspect will be relevant. Do you have a passion for what you're gonna be doing? If you don't have some degree of passion for at least some element of it, that 
may be a good reason to re-examine your desire to start this business. Uh, starting a business takes a lot of time and effort to get it off the ground and uh, get it to a stage where it's cash positive. And if you don't have a passion for one or more elements of the business, uh, you may find that the, the time demands are greater than you care to devote. And with that in mind, do you have the support of your family? Because often your family, family are the folks who are going to uh, lose a portion of your time until you get the business up on its two feet and walking on its own, so to speak. So all of these are important resources that you bring to the table that you should think about because if you feel that you have questions about any of these areas, it's better to try to address them before you start the business than after. As I've said, starting a business requires money, a lot of time, energy, you probably need to be predictably healthy, and it re often requires some skills. So those are all things that you bring to the table and or other members of your team or your partners bring to the table, and you might wanna take an inventory of all of them. So if you feel that any of the things I've just mentioned might be lacking within you or your team, uh, you might want to just jot down which might benefit from some attention on your part now while you presumably have more time as opposed to after you start the business when operating business begins to consume a huge volume of your time. So the top reasons a startup fail, this is data from 2021, but uh, was that either they ran out of cash or they were offering a product or service that didn't actually have a market. Nobody really wanted it. They thought it was great, but the people they thought would be their customers didn't show up. So these are two things to look at very carefully about your business before you begin investing your own money in it. And I'll talk more about both of these in the rest of this presentation. There are many other reasons that startups fail, but these were the most frequent two. And so they're worth thinking about because they're things that you can avoid by doing a little work before you start spending money. So, to figure out whether there is a market for what you wish to offer or not, put yourself in your customer's shoes and ask yourself, what is their problem that they would love to find a solution for? So what is the problem you are solving for them? And while you're at it, it's helpful to define why it's a problem for them. Because if you understand why it's a problem, you may have a better or a stronger marketing message for them to persuade them that they should purchase what you have to offer. And then I know this sounds like a silly question, but ask yourself, why will what you're offering solve the problem? Not from your perspective. You probably have 150 reasons why you know it will solve the problem. But ask this from your customer's perspective. If a customer sees your product or service for the first time, becomes aware of it, why do they feel that your offering is going to solve their problems? And then the last question is, why would they buy from you instead of a competitor? And don't neglect to consider what are often referred to as indirect competitors. Maybe somebody does not produce the exact same product or service that you're offering, but it is a product or service that could be used instead of yours. So for example, um, many accountants can also offer bookkeeping services. So if you're a bookkeeper, you're not just looking at bookkeepers as competitors, you're also looking at accountants as competitors. 
So having asked yourself, what problem are you solving? Why is it a problem? Why will your offering solve it? And why will they buy from you? Then <clears throat> double check that solving this problem really does interest you. Because if you're losing interest in it already, that's not a good sign. So after you figure out who's gonna have your, sorry, uh, what the problem you're solving is, ask yourself, who is likely to have this problem? What attributes tend to be common amongst a, a majority of your customers? Not all of them necessarily. So is it a certain age range or a certain gender or income range or geographic area or stage of life or occupation or hobby or their politics or their goals in life? Um, Usually you'll find that there are a series of demographic characteristics like this that define your likely customers. If you're selling to a business, fine. You will find there tend to be types of businesses that tend to be your customers. Is it a certain size? Is it a certain industry? Uh, is it a size measured by employees or size measured by revenues? Uh, is it the geographic area that they cover? Um, is it the, the type of employee they have? Uh, are there any number of attributes that your most frequent customers will tend to have? Now, you may find that you can group your customers into more than one uh, grouping and that 30% of your business comes from these kinds of customers and 20% comes from these kinds of customers. And then another 10% comes from a third kind. Don't try to map everybody out, but do try to get to the 50% mark. Where is 50% or more of your business tending to come from? And the reason you want to identify all these attributes about your customers is because that will help you find them and that will help you sell your product or service to them. It'll help you market what you're offering. So this is uh, one version of what some people refer to as a one-page business plan. And I encourage you to, to fill this out for yourself and your business. Typically people start on the left, defining the problem. <clears throat> and obviously being just one page, we're just talking a couple of bullets here, some, some shorthand cryptic notes for yourself as to exactly what the problem is that your target customers face. And then on the right side, you can put down some brief descriptions of who the major target market segments are that you identified from what I was just talking about. And then once you define the problem on the left and the target market on the right, then you're ready to define your solution in the middle and think very carefully about how and why this solution applies to each target market specifically. And I say this because you may find that the way you wish to market your solution differs from one target market to another. If so, might as well take advantage of that from day one. So the goal of thinking through the problem, the target markets and the solution is to be able to develop a statement shown at the bottom here, a value proposition statement. And a value proposition can follow a very formulaic approach saying something like uh, for uh, customers with ingrown toenails, my ingrown toenail cream will make it go away in 24 hours, uh, three times faster than any competitive product. <clears throat> Obviously I've made this all up, but that's an example of a value proposition. It defines who you're selling it to, what it is you're offering, <clears throat> how it solves their problem, and the <clears throat> a brief mention of what that problem is for them as they perceive it. And then <clears throat> some reason why they should buy from you instead of one of your direct or indirect competitors. Now, I will say that 
I don't think I've ever seen a value proposition statement that I thought was perfect. Um, so don't kill yourself trying to make this an absolutely perfect statement. But if you can get it down to one sentence or maybe two <clears throat> that sort of become your elevator pitch, when somebody says, what do you do? This is how you answer them. And ideally, if they are a potential customer, your summary of who your ideal customer is, what it is you're offering, and how it solves a problem for them will interest them to the point where they say, oh, you know, do you have a card? Can I get your contact information? <clears throat> so developing a value proposition, perhaps one for each target market, if they differ in significant ways, is a incredibly valuable part of developing your marketing strategy and identifying not only who you wish to market your product or service to, but also how you are likely to market to them. What message are you going to use to sell your, your product or your service? You may wish to include a number of uh, adjectives in your value proposition that describe some of the values that you offer such as simple, friendly, fast, fun, fresh, full service, inexpensive, et cetera. <clears throat> One caution though, if you use words like only or first or best, you know, we are Maine's best whoopie pie, uh, make sure you can back it up. If you're Maine's best whoopie pie, did the Press Herald uh, name you Maine's best whoopie pie or do you have some third party evidence that people thought you were the best. Um, all the other adjectives in the word cloud up here are things that aren't really measurable. And so they're pretty safe claims to make if you feel that they're true, but only first and best are measurable things. So don't make that claim unless you can back it up. <clears throat> now, returning to your value proposition, uh, many people, when they fill out that one page business plan, tend to do so from their perspective as the business owner, as the inventor of the product or the service or the deliverer of the service. Try to take your customer's perspective, put yourself in their shoes. How would you describe who they are from their perspective? And how would they describe the product or service that you are offering them. Often you may find that they might have a very different description. So if you have some buddies and you're, you're doing a physical product, you know, go show it to them and, and say, how would you describe this? What, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Because if the way you describe it is not what comes to mind first for your customers, you may find that your description is not reaching them. They're not understanding that what you offer solves their problem because you didn't use the word or the phrase that they would normally use to describe it. How would they describe the pain point or need that your offering addresses? And how would they describe the ways in which your offering is better than other options that they have available to them? And how would they describe the emotions that they feel after purchase or use of your offering? So uh, clearly what I'm getting at here is doing some market research is really important. And there's no substitute for talking to people who you, well, if this is before you're launching your business, talking to people who you expect to become your customers. So try to get yourself in front of them, talk to them, ask them questions. Don't say, do you like this product? Because that's a yes or no answer. Instead, ask them, how would you describe this product? Um, in what ways might this product be useful to you? In what ways might this product not be useful to you? But try really hard to ask questions that are not yes or no questions. The interview is over very quickly if you ask yes or no questions. 
But if you can ask open-ended questions where they really have to respond with a whole sentence or a whole bunch of ideas, you're going to learn a lot about your target market, the vocabulary they use, their interests, and the value that they perceive in what you're offering. And that is incredibly important to you in your marketing so that you can use their perspective and have your marketing be something that they interpret as you intended from the beginning. So here are some examples of value propositions. Some are pretty good and others not so much. Uh, a coffee shop might say, we help our local customers feel good and do good by selling artisanal coffee in a community focused space. So this tells you a lot about the goal. They want to help the customers feel good. Uh, it's not clear to me how their customers will do good necessarily. And artisanal coffee, you know, how does that by itself make them feel good or do good? Um, the community focused space may mean that one of the benefits is community. And that why might be why I go to the coffee shop is, is to nurture community. So that's useful. But the phrasing of this is sort of odd to me. Um, now I take to tend, I tend to take things somewhat overly literally at times, but um, I think this does a, a decent job of describing what they're trying to do. But at the same time, as you could tell, I have some quibbles about it. Amazon, heard of them? Um, Amazon strives to be the earth's most customer centric company. What the heck does that mean? Uh, that doesn't really tell me anything about fast delivery, about breadth of product, about type of product offered. The minute I have any less than positive experience with Amazon, all of a sudden I'm not gonna believe that they're the world's most customer centric company. So yes, that might be good for an internal vision, but I would question this as a value proposition. It doesn't really describe their value to me as one of their customers. But it may be very useful internally for the strategic planning uh, and you know, company decisions may be driven by a statement like this quite nicely. But I, I would say it's not really a great value proposition. Walmart offers a wide selection of national brands at the lowest price anywhere. Whoa, uh, I know exactly what they do from that description. And that tells me why I would wanna go there to see if they carry whatever I want. So to me, that is a pretty good value proposition. It doesn't necessarily get at who they sell to, but Walmart tries to sell to everybody. So maybe it's okay to leave that out. And lastly, Whole Foods provides healthy, ethically produced, exceptionally high quality food at a price premium. Uh, well, I wouldn't tell my customers that I'm putting it at a price premium, but once again, this is probably good as an internal uh, vision statement or mission statement, but uh, provides healthy, ethically produced, exceptionally high quality food. Okay, that describes what they're offering very clearly. Um, it doesn't necessarily describe who their target market is, although at a price premium, implies that they're probably selling to people who have some money to, to spare. So um, there might be other ways you could describe their target market in ways that uh, wouldn't discourage customers from visiting. So once again, I would say this is probably not intended as a value proposition statement. It's probably more of an internal mission statement, but it could pretty easily be tweaked into being a, a decent value proposition statement. So those are some examples of value propositions. And as I said earlier, I have yet to meet one that I think is 100% perfect. And so don't expect yourself to come up with one 
that hits it out of the ballpark, even after you've gone through 15 drafts. Um, I always write and rewrite and I look at it a week later and I edit it again. I look at it two weeks later and I edit it again. You may never be totally happy with your value proposition statement and that's okay. But as you talk to more and more customers and potential customers, and you try out ways of describing what you're offering, I think you'll find that you end up landing on a description of what you offer that quickly conveys your benefit to them in an effective way. So um, here's a, a more blank version of this that you can use later to develop your value proposition if you print out a copy of this page and then just jot your stuff down on it. Um, as I mentioned before, ask your customers or potential customers open-ended questions and use that as a way of testing your value proposition. Not that you necessarily start by telling them about your draft value proposition, but show them your product or show them a description of your service and ask them, you know, well, who do you think would buy this? And what do you think they would find appealing about it? And see how they describe things. And the more people you talk to, the more you're gonna learn. And so if you can start selling your offering, maybe in smaller batches initially or whatever, sooner as opposed to later, uh, you'll gain a lot more experience selling it and that will be useful in refining your value proposition. So I have yet to meet somebody who was entirely happy with their value proposition. Everybody I talk to, keeps tweaking it and tweaking it. Uh, maybe it's every day for the first week and then every week for the next two, three months. And then, you know, once a month for the next couple of months. And they may just change one word or rearrange some things in there. But the more experience they get interacting with their customers, the easier it is for them to reflect their customers' preferences and terminology in their value proposition. Don't neglect the fact that each market segment of yours can have its own value proposition that differs from that for the other market segments. That's okay. If you can cover all your segments with one value proposition, that's great. But if you can't, that's okay too. Don't overlook the fact that your markets may change over time. Many markets evolve. New competitors enter, new technologies become available, um, fashion changes. Uh, so you may find that your markets evolve either in your direction or away from where, where you are. And you have to stay on top of that. And that may drive change in your value proposition as well over time. So do keep revisiting your value proposition. Um, I would say at least a couple of times a year, even once you're in business, because you wanna make sure that it continues to define who you're marketing to, what problem you're solving for them, how you solve that problem, and why you're better than the competition. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about value propositions, here are three links. When you get the slide deck, you can click on these links in the slide deck and it will take you to some websites that talk about value propositions in much greater detail than I have here, but it, it gives you some more assistance in coming up with a good value proposition for your business. So I encourage you to go take a look at these. Next up, you want to build your team of professionals. Now, when I said build your team earlier, most of you were probably thinking employees. Uh, your employees may be part of your team for sure, but no, I was not thinking of employees. Uh, SCORE offers free mentoring services. So you can easily sign up for a business mentor with SCORE or any number of other business mentoring organizations or business incubators. Uh, having a mentor gives you somebody to bounce ideas off of uh, who may have a slightly different background than you do and can serve as a, a neutral sounding board. Not that they're necessarily going to tell you what you should do, but just having a conversation with somebody who's familiar with some of the challenges of starting a business can be incredibly useful to your thinking. 
you no doubt will need to have an attorney at one time or another, maybe not very often, but it's good to identify one that you wish to use for your business. And you may wish to consult them as you're starting your business, for example, if you have a partner or if you're about to put together uh, an employee manual or something like that, you will need an attorney at some point. You will need a banker. Uh, maybe you're not gonna need loans today, but you might need them down the road. It never hurts to meet the loan officer at the bank you're using for your business banking account and have a chat with them about the variety of services that they offer, not only uh, long-term loans, but things like lines of credit or uh, perhaps receivables factoring, depending on your business. Learn about the services they can offer and make a note to yourself which ones might interest you in the future. Talk to your insurance agent or find an insurance agent. Most insurance agents are uh, representing a range of potential lines of insurance, perhaps from multiple underwriting companies. And they are not going to charge you for a consultation. They will tell you, oh, we recommend you get this kind and that kind and third kind and fourth kind of insurance policy to cover all the risks inherent in your business. Just because they recommend it does not mean you have to buy it, obviously. But it's often useful to get their opinion as to what kinds of policies you should consider. And then if you feel that that's a risk that could jeopardize your business, if it happens and you're not insured for it, then it might be worth purchasing that type of insurance and you can compare costs and benefits by shopping around a couple of different insurance agents. But do treat your insurance agent as part of your team because they are one of the team of people that help you ensure that you have considered all of the factors that you as the owner need to consider for the health of your business. You no doubt will need an accountant of, as of some sort at some time, maybe not to keep your books every day or every week, but maybe once a year at tax time. Uh, maybe you're using an accountant to do your bookkeeping. Maybe you want a separate bookkeeper. Maybe you're doing your own bookkeeping. All of those are possible ways of doing it. But no matter how you do it, you will want to have an accountant for occasional questions, if not more. Then two other things that some people don't always think of. The first is business peers. If you're opening a coffee shop, you might be able to call up the owner of a coffee shop in a geographic region that you are not competing with. So if you want to offer a open a coffee shop in Maine, call a coffee shop in Vermont and say, you know, hey, I'm about to open a coffee shop in Maine, just my one little shop, I'm not planning a chain or anything. Um, would you be willing to chat with me? And uh, tell me if I'm doing something stupid, what kinds of mistakes I could avoid. And we've had a number of clients who have found those business peers that they develop long-term relationships with have been invaluable in helping them build their confidence about certain things, helping them avoid certain mistakes, and helping them identify resources they might not have thought of otherwise. So do turn to your business peers as part of your team. Yes, some might be competitors and you have to tread carefully around them, but that doesn't prevent you from having cordial relationships with your competitors. Learn what you can from them, but you'll probably learn more from people that are not direct competitors of yours. And then lastly, trade organizations. Um, this could be things like the Chamber of Commerce, but many professions have trade organizations, which for membership fee will provide you with access, say, to discounted insurance policies that are unique to your profession perhaps, or uh, survey results that help you estimate market size and trends in the market, that sort of thing. So if you, there are trade organizations that apply to your business, do look into them. So all of these are people that you should consider part of your team of professionals in addition to your employees that would help you not only launch your business, 
but also operated successfully. I mentioned insurance. There are many different kinds of insurance. Some may be relevant to your business. Some may not be relevant to your business. Much depends on the specifics of the business you're in. Um, but this list is here mostly just to give you a quick sense of, oh my, yes, there are a lot of different types of insurance that I should be aware of and look into to see whether or not they would be relevant for my particular case. And you should also learn about the relevant regulations that might apply. And there are three levels at which you need to research regulations that might or might not apply to the business you're thinking of starting. The first is the town or city that you're in. Uh, local ordinances may require you to get some sort of a license from the town, like a home occupation permit or uh, a license specific to your type of business. If you're, for instance, in uh, the food preparation business, you will need to have a commercial kitchen and commercial kitchens are licensed by the town that you're in, at least in Maine. Um, you may need to get permission from either the a code uh, enforcement officer for zoning or perhaps even from some historic district commission if you're in a historic building and trying to adapt it to, for a different use. You may need, if you're leasing, to get the consent of your landlord for the intended use of the property. And you should get that consent in writing. Uh, you need to make sure that you comply with building codes. That's what the code enforcement officer does. But you may also need to get a fire inspection for the number of people you expect to be in the area that you're leasing, if you're leasing or if you own, um, you, you, the fire marshal will need to say that, yes, you can have up to this many people in this area safely. Uh, you may be subject to local taxes. Many towns in Maine uh, tax businesses based on their assets. Um, and you may need a certificate of occupancy from the town. Licenses that are needed at the state or federal level uh, vary depending on the kind of business. Uh, so for example, if you're an attorney you, or a doctor, you have licensing requirements that are not from the town or the city. They may be from other organizations, not necessarily the state or the federal government, but uh, if you're an engineer, you need an engineering license. If you... Uh, are open to the public, you may need to comply with ADA requirements. So you need to understand the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, you, if you have employees, you need to understand and comply with labor laws and immigration laws. If you have employees, you need to make sure you're complying with uh, withholding their payroll taxes and paying their social security, Medicare and income tax withholdings. And if you are selling a product or service that is subject to sales tax in the state that the customer lives, then you may need to know about how to collect and submit sales taxes that you collect on behalf of the state on the products or services that you sell. Um, if you have questions about any of these, I have found that the employees at the state level have been very helpful in resolving most questions. Uh, not so much at the federal level, but definitely at the state level. So if you, for instance, want to know if what you're selling is subject to sales tax or not, call the state and they will be happy to answer that question for you. Um, the written documentation often feels vague to me. And it's a good idea to get a very specific answer that yes, your, your product or service is or is not subject to sales tax. So... Um, I hope that uh, all of what I've just talked about there has raised a bunch of potential questions in your mind. So you might wish to note down um, who you've not already talked to that you might wish to add to your team. And at what point do you wish to add to your team? Maybe not this week, maybe it's next month or two months from now, but make a note to yourself of when you want to reach out to that person and, and try to make contact. Uh, what insurance is needed or desirable? What regulations might apply? Should you look into? Uh, and uh, note all those things as more research to be done. So 
you've talked, you've thought about what your product or service is, why you're doing it, who your customers are, why they're going to buy from you. And you've talked to enough people that you know that there's demand for what you intend to offer. So what type of business should you set up? There are five very common types listed here. A sole proprietorship, an LLC, a general partnership, a limited liability partnership, or a C corporation. All the underlined items here are links once again, so you can click on these when you get the copy of the slide deck and research each of these more. The majority of our clients set up limited liability corporations. It's pretty simple to do. You can do it yourself. You don't need an attorney to do it. It costs $100 and that was $175, I think, to establish an LLC in Maine. And then $85 a year after that to renew your, your filing. You don't have to do that. You can operate as a sole proprietor. Uh, the difference is that as a sole proprietor, if somebody sues you, all of your personal assets are potentially at risk. Whereas if you are doing business as an LLC, then only the assets of the business are at risk, which highlights the importance of keeping business assets and personal assets completely separate. There are also partnerships, which means that there's more than one person who is involved in owning and making decisions for the company. Partnerships can give you incredible flexibility, uh, but as a result, they can be more complex. They can limit liability or they may not limit liability. A general partner assumes liability for the partnership, whereas a limited liability partnership uh, means that the partners have limited personal liability. And then there are some partnerships which have both general and limited partners. And limited partners are usually passive investors and general partners are usually the active managers. <laughs> but any kind of partnership should have a partnership agreement. You should talk to an attorney in drafting a partnership agreement because a partnership agreement is both a prenuptial agreement and a divorce agreement all rolled into one with a lot of other stuff as well. And so while it may be expensive to get an attorney to help you develop it, it's cheaper to have a good agreement than it is to not have an agreement in place and run into trouble later on, say when one partner wishes to leave and be bought out, but the process for valuing the company and buying out the partner has not been specified. If you get into a dispute at that point, that can be a very expensive legal process. So that's why we strongly recommend you talk to an attorney for the legal parts of it and an accountant for the tax parts of it so that you fully understand both the legal and the tax benefits of whichever form of business seems to interest you. Alyssa asks, what happens if you have an LLC and get sued, but your company has little assets? Um, I'm not an attorney, so uh, I'm not 100% confident that what I'm saying is entirely accurate. But my sense is that if you've done a good job of keeping your personal assets separate from your company assets, and that means you've got a personal checking account, you have a company checking account, you never, ever, ever buy a personal item using your company credit card. You never, ever, ever buy a personal item using a company check. Company account is only used for company purchases. Now, you can buy something personally for the company and then sell it to the company and write yourself a reimbursement check. That's okay, providing you have the receipt and you document why it was needed for company purposes. Uh, but that's what I mean by keeping company and personal assets completely separate. So if you've done a good job of that and you have a signed operating agreement, even if it's just a single member of LLC, that's the requirement that you have a signed operating agreement. There's a boilerplate for the single member LLC that you, know, you fill in six or eight little blanks, sign at the bottom, put in your files, and nobody ever sees it again if you don't get sued. 
Um, if you do get sued, you can say, yes, here's my operating agreement. Uh, if you've done all that, then in theory, only the assets of the LLC are at risk if you're sued. So if somebody says, I'm suing you, and you say, well, you know, my LLC only has $1,247 in assets, their attorney may say, never mind, because they can't get more than the assets of your company. Now, they might still sue you because they want to put you out of business, but uh, in theory, they can't get more assets than the company holds. If this is a concern for you, I strongly recommend that you consult an attorney who is much better versed in such things than I am. If you have a partner or two or three or more, you must have an operating agreement also referred to as a partnership agreement. It defines everything about your working relationship. It can get very specific. Who has how much of a vote? Who gets what percentage of the income stream? The voting percentages are not necessarily the same as the income stream percentages. Who makes what kinds of decisions? Uh, how do new partners join? How do existing partners get bought out? All of those are specified in an operating agreement. It serves as a what if document <coughs> detailing how the partners will handle a number of situations that come up fairly commonly in partnerships. Having one, can avoid very costly legal disputes later because it will specify exactly how common situations will be dealt with. There's always the possibility an uncommon situation will come up that was not mentioned in the agreement, but that's the reason for consulting an attorney who's experienced in partnership agreements, <coughs> excuse me, is to make sure that your agreement does cover the most common situations. Every attorney I've talked to has recommended that each partner should have their own attorney review the partnership agreement with their interests specifically in mind. Some people don't wanna do that for cost reasons, in which case some companies will have the company or the partnership engage the attorney on behalf of the company and review the agreement just in general not representing any one partner, but instead just expressing a generic opinion as whether this seems to address uh, the common areas of need in partnership agreements and whether in their opinion, it seems to treat all classes of partners fairly. <coughs> so if you're not gonna be solo, uh, do, put together an operating agreement and do have it reviewed by an attorney. Once you've decided on the form you wish your company to take, you will need to determine a company name. Uh, we can provide you with a, a quick checklist of, of resources to go to to help with this process, but uh, check the, the main Secretary of State's registry of corporations to make sure the name is not already used in Maine. You may also wish to check the US Patent and Trademark Office. They have a, a trademark database search function and you wanna make sure that the name you choose is not already trademarked nationally for the same kind of use as you're gonna be using it for. <coughs> um, then after you know the name is not in use, you may also wish to check by the way, a domain name uh, search to make sure that the anticipated domain name for your website is not already in use either. Um, you can then establish your corporation, which sets its name. Uh, you'll receive a certificate of formation from the state. Uh, Maine typically takes two weeks or so, maybe three, when there's a backup, um, to get you a certificate of formation. Once you have that, you can go online to the IRS and obtain your federal EIN number, your employer identification number. Uh, that is the equivalent of a social security number for your company. And <clears throat> many banks will require you to have both a certificate of formation as well as an EIN number to open a company bank account. 
You'd also need these to obtain a sales tax certificate from the state. Uh, you may need these from multiple states if you're operating in multiple states. And uh, the sales tax certificate would give you another registration number, your sales tax ID number. If you are purchasing products for resale, your sales tax application can also lead to your receiving a sales tax exemption certificate, which allows you to purchase products from your suppliers without paying sales tax because you will be collecting sales tax on those when you resell them and you'll be submitting that sales tax to the state. If you do pay sales tax, it's not the end of the world. When you report it to the state, you'll say, I sold this for $100, so I owe $5.50 in sales tax, but I already paid $4.20 in sales tax when I bought it, so you'll only owe the difference in that sales tax amount to the state. Um, you'll want to open a business checking account and then obtain any licenses needed, and at that point, uh, you're probably ready to start your business. Uh, don't forget about insurance. So hopefully all of this raised a few questions in your mind and now's a good time to jot them down. What type of business seemed most appropriate for you? So proprietor, LLC, partnership, C corporation. Um, have you researched a potential name for your business both in the state as well as nationally, as well as on the internet? Um, will you owe sales taxes to any of the states that your customers are in? Think about what size of bank might be most relevant to you. If you're dealing mostly locally, maybe having a local or regional bank is fine. If you're selling nationally, then maybe a national bank would be more useful. Talk to representatives in a local or regional bank and a national bank get a sense of their fees, their services. But in general, our experience is if you're going to be operating locally, the local banks are going to likely be the most supportive of you. And the national banks um, won't be as convenient for you as a small business typically. However, if you have international customers, you may need a bank that can handle foreign currency transactions really easily, et cetera. And that might mean that a national bank is exactly what you want. But um, if you want somebody who's gonna understand your business and more inclined to give you a loan when you just barely qualify for one, uh, that's more likely to be a local or regional bank. And then uh, don't forget to look into whether your business will need any local, state, or federal licenses. Usually, they're in professions that's pretty clear you need a license. But once again, you if you can find somebody who's already in that business, you could ask them, were any licenses required by your state or the, the federal government and see what they say. Which gets us to a question that everybody has. Where am I going to find the money that I need to start my business? So the first question that I would pose to you is how much funding will you need? And the answer to that is a combination of both the money that you need to get started and the money needed to underwrite the operation of your business until you get to break even, which as I said earlier, could be very short or it could be a year or more, depends on the business. So in most cases, you probably need more money than you think you need. Um, it may not be a lot more, but even 10 more dollars than you have can be a problem. So spend the time to develop a cash flow projection that looks out two to three years. Now, once again, the cash flow projection is underlined here. This is a link you can click on to get a, a sample cash flow projection to help you with the process. Um, I know projecting is, is challenging, but try to make it a reasonable, not a, a rose colored glasses projection and see how much cash is needed for both startup and for initial operations until you're generating enough revenue to start 
generating cash. That is the total amount of cash that you're going to need to start up. And having that number in mind before you go looking for funding is really important. So where can you find funding? Well, the most common sources are in this order. By far and away, the largest number of entrepreneurs use personal savings in starting up their business. The question you need to ask yourself is how much of your personal savings are you willing to put at risk in starting this business? Keep some powder dry. Don't put everything you have into it. The next source of funding is often bootstrapping. Starting the business in a way that minimizes your expenses and lets you start generating revenue, even if you're not as profitable as you could eventually be if, if, if you do other things or do things a little differently. But by finding a way to start with minimal expenses, you can start developing your market, understanding your market, refining your marketing before you put a significant financial investment into your business. Another source is friends and family. Um, sometimes it's not a good idea to tap friends and family. If you do rely on friends and family for funding for your business, I would encourage you to have a note that you sign with them. Some paper document that describes exactly what their expectations should be. Is this a loan? Is this a gift? Is this an investment that they're expecting some sort of return on? And if so, what kind of return? How is that going to be determined? Um, if it's a loan, what's the interest rate? And over how many years is it going to be repaid? I strongly recommend putting that in writing and in the process, hopefully maintaining good family relationships. <laughs> um, there are some grants or competitions out there. Uh, you may have heard some of them, uh, Top Gun, Greenlight Maine, and so on. Uh, Maine Technology, Technology Institute is a source of grants if you're producing a tech product, for example. Um, there are not a huge number of them. Most of them involve a fair amount of work, which is often helpful to you as a business person because you may learn a lot from the work you're doing. But they are very uncertain as to whether you're actually going to get a grant from them or not. You know, if you're the winner or the runner up, maybe you get some money, but maybe you don't. So in general, my recommendation is enter the competitions or apply for a grant. If you feel you're going to learn something from the process more so than because you expect to get the money. Crowdfunding is popular today with the internet, et cetera. Uh, crowdfunding is heavily dependent on your already having developed your community of followers. If you don't have much of a community of followers yet, then crowdfunding isn't necessarily terribly likely to generate a lot of money for you unless you get lucky and go viral. But there's so much competition trying to go viral on social media these days that um, your best bet for crowdfunding is if you've already developed your community, if you already have your following, then you can ask them to support you often by, in effect, prepaid sales. You know, buy now, you'll get it in three months, and I'll give you a discounted price for buying now. And by their buying now, that funds all of your manufacturing costs and uh, maybe a smaller profit than you hope to get eventually, but it lets you prove that the product works and satisfies people and gets your first batch produced. <clears throat> um, loans are something which obviously you tend to get from a bank, but you may get loans from individuals as well. Um, many banks, if you're starting a brand new company, are not gonna be willing to lend you money unless you are willing to personally guarantee the loan. And that usually means something like committing the equity in your house to paying off the loan if need be. So if they say we need a personal guarantee, that means your personal assets will be at risk if you are unable to repay that loan via the company alone. 
And you've probably heard of venture capital. Uh, many people hope to get money from venture capital at some point. Venture capitalists typically want a company that will become very big within the next five to 10 years. What do I mean by very big? Typically, they're looking for a total market size of at least 100 to $200 million nationwide or internationally. Um, they will insist on owning a percentage of your company. They may insist on a seat on your board. Uh, you will give up more of your company than you might think in order to get venture capital funding. And you, in the process, are likely to get a lot of pressure to grow your business as quickly as you possibly can, which may or may not be the route that you want to follow. So venture capital is actually a route that a relatively small percentage of companies follow. The more typical thing is to use personal savings and bootstrapping, maybe some friends and family, maybe competition, maybe crowdfunding, get the company to a point where you've got a little bit of history and then maybe go to a bank after a year or two and get a loan to help fund greater growth and to grow from there. So uh, that's the, the more common approach. There are exceptions to everything. If you have questions, talk to a banker, talk to a mentor. Um, we're all happy to help you figure out how to get the funds necessary to launch your business or alternatively, how to figure out a way of needing fewer funds to launch your business. Bootstrapping, which I referred to earlier, means funding your business's growth using the business's own profits. Doing so reduces many risks, particularly your financial risk, because uh, your financial risk is basically all the money that you put into the business. Now, obviously, bootstrapping is going to be easier to do if the startup costs for the business are smaller. If you need $1,000, it's a lot easier to bootstrap your business than if you need $100,000. Um, so some types of businesses, if you want to develop an app and, for phones and sell that, and you're not a coder yourself, it's probably going to cost you fifty dollars to $100,000 to develop that very first version of the app. And if you don't have that kind of money, nobody's going to lend it to you. <clears throat> so some businesses like that cannot really be bootstrapped. On the other hand, if you do have the skill to do the coding yourself, you could bootstrap your business by writing all the code yourself. Um, so the idea is to start small, build your experience with your target market by selling at craft fairs, at uh, you know, church suppers, at um, school book fairs, whatever. Uh, start small, start opportunistically, and verify that the market is there, verify that the market is what you think it is, and then grow from there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the goal in bootstrapping is try something, Get out and sell it. Listen to the feedback you get. Use the funds from the sales to make your next batch, maybe new and improved, and then repeat. So make five, sell them. If it turns out they had problems, fix those problems, make another five, get out there, sell them again, see if they still have problems, and so on. That approach lets you avoid wasting a lot of money building 500 of something that needed a design improvement. Some ways that you can bootstrap your business. Moonlighting is one. If you don't quit your job yet and build your business on the side, your income from your current job can help fund the start of your business. Or... In some businesses, you could start by subcontracting. If you're a carpenter and you want to go out on your own, you can start by working for somebody else as a subcontractor. And while you're working for them, develop your skills, but also develop your knowledge of the market that you want to serve. So that when you do go out on your own, you have firsthand knowledge of what 
these kinds of customers typically want. You can also, for some things, uh, place your product with somebody else to be sold. So if you're an artist, you might have your paintings in a gallery or a restaurant, and they might take a huge percentage of the sale price, but at least it's a quick way for you to find out whether there is a market for what you're doing or not. Um, and so think carefully about where you're placing it. You wanna make sure that your target market frequents that place, but uh, that's another way of starting small with minimal financial investment. And then, as I mentioned earlier, special events like school functions, church fairs, county fairs, uh, farmer's markets are all quick and easy ways for a low cost of getting out there and starting to try and gauge real market interest in your product or service. Just make sure that the places you pick are indeed ones that are likely to attract your target market. But clearly, if you already have a job and it's generating income for you, uh, keep it as long as you can and use that income to help fund your business. So hopefully some of these ideas will have been appealing to you. So you might wish to jot down which seemed like the most viable funding sources for your business. Uh, think about whether perhaps a slightly simpler offering than what you have in mind at the moment. What's the simplest product or service you could offer that would still offer value to your customers? The simpler it is, the faster you can start offering it to somebody and then improving it from there. Don't feel you have to develop the final perfect product before you start selling it. See if you can develop some, as it's often called, minimum viable product that has enough to make it worth somebody's time and money to buy because it is useful, even if you know that you can make it more useful over time. Is there a low risk, low cost way to test your market to verify that your assumptions about your market and what they want and what they will pay are true? Um, do put together a cash flow projection and determine how much you're going to need to start your company. And can you produce that from a combination of your savings and any income left over after living expenses from your current job? And then can any additional features that you wanna add into your product or service be developed by profits from your business? As you start selling the first few, will you make enough profit to, to help develop the next features along with whatever income you're getting from your job? Turning to watching your company's financials. If you're the owner, you need to understand your financials. Not the way an accountant would. High level is fine, but <laughs> there are often uh, two kinds of people in the world. Those that, that are allergic to, to numbers and those that love numbers. Well, and there's a lot of people in between. Um, but learn to use your financial statements. You don't have to be an accountant, but you do need them to manage your business and make sure that you're managing your business prudently. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of reconciling your books every month. Make sure that what your accounting books say your bank balance should be as of the end of last month really was your bank balance at the end of last month. Um, here are three links to give you an overview of a balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows. They're all important statements that if you're using an accounting package, it can generate for you. Uh, and you should learn to use them to manage your business. Uh, if you want, you can work with a mentor to help you figure out which things to watch. Uh, we also offer other workshops on key accounts to watch in your financial statements to make sure that your business is operating as you expect. So everything I've talked about up until here goes into what is often referred to as a business plan. A business plan is a living document, meaning it's not something you write and then you forget. 
it'll, it'll probably need to be updated every time you want to go for a loan. If you're bringing a new partner, you probably have to update it. You may want to just update it for yourself because it's the way that you think about the near and longer term future and make sure that you have a well enough thought through plan to help you get there. <clears throat> so a business plan is a living document. It documents your vision for the business and, and your goals for the business. It can get very specific. You know, I want to get to sales of 100,000 by this time. Um, it can be very short or it can be very long. Uh, there are links to a short version and a long version here. <clears throat> um, in general, the business plan will describe the problem you're solving, what your solution is, who your market is, who your competition is. It'll include your financial forecast. It'll describe who your team members are and it'll describe your business model. If you want some examples, the Portland Public Library has uh, free access to a database of uh, anonymized business plans. And uh, so click on the link which says examples and you can see tons of examples of, of business plans that people put together. Uh, it doesn't have to be incredibly long, but it does have to be well thought through. And the key is to remember that your plan will be read by knowledgeable, skeptical people who probably are very familiar with reading lots of business plans. They've seen incredibly optimistic ones. They've seen incredibly pessimistic ones. They're not looking for something that projects um, rosiness and sunshine. They're looking for business plans that are credible, that seem to make reasonable assumptions and have thought things through. So if there's third-party objective data that you can provide as part of your business plan, please do include it. Uh, even if it's a bigger market than you're actually serving, if you know that the market is growing 10% a year, then it might be reasonable to conclude that your market's also growing 10% a year. So provide objective data when you can. And when you make assumptions, like I think I'm gonna get 20% of the business in this town for the thing that I do, then state where, excuse me, state where that number came from. Um, why 20%? Oh, because there are four other competitors. I'm going to be one of five. So I think I'm going to get 20%. Why is that a reasonable assumption? You might want to discuss why you think you're going to get a share equal to your four other competitors. Um, so as long as you try to be, you know, fair, honest with yourself, your business plan is likely to be good enough. And uh, the major goal is to help you figure out is this business worth starting? And if the answer is yes, then you develop the roadmap to help you start it. Uh, you may wish to show it to bankers if you're applying for loans, to investors if you're asking them for loans or asking them to invest in your company, to potential partners, perhaps to your first or key employees. You may find that in some particular industries, if you're asking to buy wholesale from somebody, they may want to see your business plan because they don't sell to just anybody. They want you to get to a certain volume within a certain time if they're going to be willing to sell to you. But most of all, the business plan is for you to help you better understand the potential risk you're taking in starting the business and make sure it's what you're willing to do, but also to help you lay out your plans for starting the business so that it serves as a guide, as a roadmap for the key stages of your business's startup. So if you put all this together, you start at the top left and your target market has some sort of a problem. You define who it is that has the problem. You define what your solution is to it. Then you describe your solution from the perspective of your target market. How would your customers describe your solution? And you develop your value proposition. You then test it, you measure the results, perhaps using customer feedback, perhaps using financial statements, 
perhaps all of the above. You tweak your offering and then you repeat the cycle again. And your business plan lies at the center of it in that it describes all of this and that's its value. So starting a business can be a lot of work and it may not be for everyone. To maximize your chances of having it all go smoothly for yourself, know your customers well, know your competition well, start small, test, learn and adapt, repeat, and reach out to your team. SCORE mentors are here to help. Uh, sign up for other workshops that we or others offer. Learn all you can before you start the business because once you start the business, you're gonna have a lot less time than you do now. Um, if you're not terribly familiar with SCORE, we offer free mentoring and free workshops. We're a nonprofit or a partner of the Small Business Administration. We have about 320 offices throughout the United States and we are the largest volunteer mentoring organization in the US. If you'd like to sign up for our mentoring, I, you are welcome to use this QR code either now or in the slide deck that you receive. And uh, you, you'll be taken to a web page that asks you for your zip code and will connect you with a more or less local mentor. Um, so at this point, I'm perfectly happy to answer any questions that you may have that weren't addressed by things in the slide deck. Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Uh, your video may not show because this is a webinar, but you can certainly speak or put them in the chat. Um, are, there, are there any topics that uh, you wish to go in? Frederick, yes. Uh, let, me, uh, let me unmute people here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so Frederick. You raise your hand. And now I've allowed you to talk. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I'll play, yeah, yeah. Uh I just came across that I'm 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 getting ready to retire soon. And I want to start a business. I like computers. As everybody been telling me I got a neck, I could be able to teach it, you know? And uh, you know, senior citizen, you know, basic computer skills. And I like computer, that's my hobby. Mm -hmm. so my thing is, uh, some people say, don't, don't try nothing right now. Just go out and get experience first. Then as you get better with your, your with your skill, then you can start adding on to pay service. So somebody suggest that too, because I'm about to retire soon. So but I want to get to a business, something that's going to keep me occupied. I like to do for income, extra income. I'll be getting Social Security and a pension, but I know they ain't going to be enough. So I like to add on to what I'm getting. But do something I enjoy doing, it, like you said, don't quit your job. I won't be retiring. So I ain't gonna quit. I'll be retiring. So I have enough time to search and do technology. I just like your mm -hmm. opinion on that. Yeah. Um, I mean that's a route that that I included in in my doings. Um, I ended up uh, signing up with the local uh, community services organization in my town, and I taught how to use Windows courses back when. Windows was still a relatively new thing. I'm dating myself here, but um, and uh, so I also taught Excel courses and Word courses. Yeah. And uh, in the process of doing that, uh, I ended up finding other connections and and got a bunch of other jobs. Now my background was in software, so I was also doing custom software for people. But um, there, I had a lot of fun doing that, and uh, I met everybody in town hall. So for 10 years after that, when I walk into town hall, everybody knew me by name. It was cool. Um, but uh, so that's a great kind of a side gig, which can work very well if you're offering a course because you only offer the course in the area that you know you know, and you're not necessarily putting a shingle out saying, ask me any computer question. Well, you're saying, you, you know, only ask me questions about this and that, which are the two things that I know well. Right, and I like to go back to I like to go back to school, so like there are free courses. I still like to learn more as I mm -hmm. go along. So like, you know, as, as you evolve, like you said, you're a software. I always like to feel. I, I, I do I do transit worker, and uh, I'm a blue collar worker. So they're gonna all be new. And it's a new field that I'm very interested in doing. You know, so okay, I want to make sure I don't take up nobody else's time. So whatever else, question. But thank you. I, I like that. You really encouraged me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good. Well, I hope it all goes well. And uh, do sign up for a mentor if you want somebody else by your side to, to chat with about things. Yeah, I am. I am. Thank, thank, thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, sir. Other questions? Well, I'm just checking here. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I'm not seeing any other microphones unmuted. And I'm not seeing anything else in the chat window. So given it's almost our hour and a half time, which was advertised as the length of the workshop, um, I will bid you a good day. And I hope uh, your business thoughts are fruitful and interesting. And do not hesitate to reach out to other people to bounce ideas off of. And if you wish to sign up for a mentor, it is free. And uh, it's a chance to have somebody who has a breadth of business experience chat with you about your ideas and help you identify any areas you might have overlooked. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Mr. Wall, one more thing. Um, yes. My age. Uh, I'm kind of a little afraid of because this is a new this is a new ball game. I'm 62 years old, and this is a new <clears throat> this is a whole new ball game. I ain't no young whooper snapper. This is a whole. Cause I want to go back to class too and learn software a little bit more. To, you know, Excel. I love I love all that stuff. I love it. I love I love messing with it. Now, what you can tell for an old tyrant like me, a veteran. Now, you've been around this for a while. I'm just I'm just coming into this new field. Any suggestions? Any other suggestions before you leave? Um, think about who you want to have be your customer before you dive into what you're going to develop your skills on. Um, as an example, if you think your typical customer is somebody at home who needs to use it for their private purpose, maybe Google Sheets is more useful to them than Excel. And time spent learning Excel is not wasted but is not as directly relevant if most of your customers don't want to spend the money to buy Excel and would rather use Google Sheets, which is, which is free. Um, so that would be one answer. The other answer would be, oh no, I expect to have small businesses be my client. And they asked me to come in and train some of their staff on how to use Excel because they are using Excel, in which case, yes, you would want to learn Excel. Um, so, before you spend a lot of time improving your skills, first go out and talk to people that you think might become your customers and ask them, would you be interested in hiring somebody to help you learn how to use this package? Um, and if so, which package? And how do you want to approach it? Do you're looking for a class? Or are you looking for somebody to come stand over people's shoulders and, and help them through rough spots? Um, there are lots of ways of approaching it. The challenge I find is in, when teaching software, there's so many little technical details that people can't absorb it all. If I spend an hour talking about Excel, people may remember one or two things from the hour. And so it's a lot more effective to stand over somebody's shoulder and say, ah, I have a shortcut for that thing you just did. You wanna learn it. Um, and they'll remember that because it was something that they need to do. Um, so see if you can find a way of not playing teacher to introduce the right, whole right. Of people, but instead provide hints and tips that have a very high probability of being relevant to their needs at the time. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, I want for senior citizens, I think especially start with <clears throat> senior citizens first, you know, but they, they really need help. You know, I'm 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 old too, so but like I'm a senior citizen, but start with that. A lot of people I've been getting a lot of ideas to so start with senior citizen that people may not know put a password in, start with small stuff. Like I know yeah. I do. no uh, a little small stuff, yeah. You yeah. know, like grandparents wanting to see their grandkids on their iPad. Um, you know, how do I use FaceTime? Um, those kinds of things would be, I think, things you could go into retirement homes and things like that and have a built-in customer base of folks who are very eager to be able to communicate with their extended family, even though they're not local. Thank you, man. That, see, you said it. About 10 people have told me this already. told me go for it. Yeah, you're about the third person. I'm getting for professionals. So I think that's a good. I think that's a trail I want to go to. I think that's that's what I'm looking at right now. I'm about to retire this year sometime. So 
I think that's what I'm looking for. Do that. Plus, I be giving service. I be service. I like to do service. Be yeah, a service. and, I and that, yeah. as I said, go talk before you spend any money or much of your time. Go talk to people who might be your customers. Say the activity director at a retirement home, and say, "Hey, would you be interested in having somebody come in to do this?" And see what they say. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I need that. Yeah, that's what I told a lot of people. Told me to say, go to places, you know, um, you know, get, get to certain places. And they need some churches, you know, you go to certain like that. Just tell them, hey, you know, you need some citizens, need some help with their computers, or like you say, Facebook, put a password, or you go get online banking. You know what I mean? They might want to learn how to do online banking. You know, I, I play with that a lot of times. I do that a lot. I play with that a lot too. I like doing that too, you know. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. What? Thank you. Well, yeah, you, you kind of got me open now. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, mister. Thank you. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you for participating. Thank you.